Yeah, we tried to squeeze a lot onto that one chart. Otherwise, we'd had you know twelve. Oh yeah, but, yeah. one for cruise missiles, one for HQs, blah 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 blah, right. all that fun stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's a uh, it's great chart though. It covers everything, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Except for comes with comes with its own set of problems, right? Yeah, except for tech news, right? Yeah, well, it'll we'll just kill everything. So yeah, yeah. I thought Joel's video was awesome. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was great. It was just funny. I have never seen anybody actually do that, so I'm like, oh, hmm. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, let's, he, let's he go blew, think about how that works. Yeah, he blew the shit out of that stuff. Right. It was yeah. awesome. So yeah, and I mean, on the face of it, that's the way it should work, but. Then we got to think, I'm like, oh, I probably shouldn't hit every naval task force, right? So, because only an idiot would clutch them all in one spot. Yes, me. Hi. <laughs> I'm, I'm, so, I'm, I'm moving all those guys around, and I was watching what he did and went, ooh, moving together is a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, uh, shit. Well, now I'm wondering if, uh, yeah, it looks like I'm recording studio, uh, recording system audio. Okay, we're good. And if we're not, I'll make you do it again. So that's fine. We can correct the answers then. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so what I want to do? How you know, folks do all these interviews and they waste a whole bunch of time going through your first war game and you know, <laughs> your you know, childhood memories and you know, your feelings, right. your feelings and hmm. that sort of shit with designers. And all I wanted to do was have a conversation with you about and your you a little bit unique in that mm. you you're coming at this from a different angle and, we'll, and maybe we can get into that but mm-hmm. i want to have a conversation more of a deep dive into what is you know the mindset of the designer and how are they mm. how are they going about trying to design a product or a game from scratch what's the inspiration mm-hmm. how do they go through the exercise uh you know from you know, do some guys do maps first, and they do rules, or mm. or they've got a historical topic, obviously, because we're doing war games. So, right. kind of the the whole end to end cycle, and then mm-hmm. any bits of you know, insight there that you think are <laughs> relevant. Let's let's kind of talk about them. Mm. Um, but with you, Mitch, you you know, because you're you're doing stuff for GMT, one hundred percent, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, and most of your designs are. Uh, predicated upon the next war at the moment, the next war system other than civil bayonet, right? Right. Right. And then that, but that really was a wholesale kind of modernization and uplift of crisis Korea. Right. Crisis Korea. Right? Well, so yeah, the next war series was an uplift of crisis Korea. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Next war Korea was, and then silver bayonet obviously was just a, just rebranded it and updated it. And right. Right. Okay. Kind of Fresh coat of paint and clean the rules up and, Stuff like that, right? Which is which is why sometimes I laugh. You know, designers a strong word for me, I think, but right. more like an Uber developer. Right. Yeah. However you want to get it. Sure. But let's call you a designer. What the hell? Right. Right. <laughs> we'll we'll still talk to you. It's all good. Yeah. Sure. Um, right. You know, well, I'm, what I might do is turn my video off so that we don't get. Uh, much lag on you and i'm not going to use the video content anymore oh, all right. i'll probably just use, I'll, the, I'll use the audio i'll um, kill it then because i'm sure that's overwhelming the wi-fi <laughs> yeah yeah so anyway but um so what uh what i so yeah so that's an interesting point probably a good place to start in terms of mm-hmm. your perception of what you think you are and, and <laughs> mm-hmm. as it relates to game design uh right versus your personal life and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, how did you get involved initially with the, with the next war system and the, the you know, crisis Korea? Yeah. Um, well, let's take the, how about the second part of that first is yeah. I got involved because Gene had been working, this is years ago, you can actually go follow the progression in the Consum World folder for uh, the next War Series. Yeah. Gene was working on the update, and he had gotten two maps done, that, you know, which are, became the two maps of Next War Korea. And I had pulled out Crisis Korea, and I was just playing it, and I'm like, huh, this just doesn't seem to work well for me. And I'm like, well, he's redoing it, let me give him a bunch of suggestions. 
And so I would post stuff every now and then and then ask him about the update of the maps. And finally, he got tired of it, and he sent me an email. He said, hey, Mitch, you seem to be really interested in this. Why don't you just do it? <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty much how that started, um, which kind of leads into the, the first part of your, your question for me, right, is that, uh, you know, I was building on the shoulders of somebody else, um, taking a look at all the systems. How well did they work? How well did they not work? What needed to be changed? Uh, and then kind of, uh, you know, I get the right word, but providing clarity around uh, some of the systems and changing some wholesale, right? right. Uh, the, <coughs> excuse me, the advance, the advancing into cities and urban terrain, that kind of stuff is totally different in Crisis Korea than it is from the next war series. Um, and that was born straight out of uh, reading, you know, things like how, urban warfare and Fallujah and, and stuff like that is that it became, they were clearing operations, right? And so we changed, mm -hmm. I changed up the rules on that. Uh, but, so that's why it, it's kind of like, I was uh, laughing at, you know, I, I, I haven't created, from a game standpoint, I haven't created anything original, right? I have taken what existed and hopefully made it better, right? So that's why I was saying more like an uber developer than a designer, but I, th I think it's a kind of a unique role uh, to be able to take something that old, modernize it, make it work, streamline it, <clears throat> and then provide, you know, I'm, I'm not going to downplay it too much. There are some new thoughts in there, and we, I, tweak an, I tweak enough to, to make it mine, right? Um, but I'm still building on, on somebody else's work, really. Cool. And, and I gladly acknowledge that, right? I'm yeah. not trying to take credit for, you know, that's my system, but the next war flavor is mine, right? Right. Right. And what um, what was the original release date for Crisis Korea? Oh, jeez. Was it uh, 80s, right? I think 90s. Okay. Because I think the first three, yeah, because uh, Silver Bayonet, I know that wasn't next war, but Silver Bayonet was, we just did the 50th anniversary. Right. And that was 90. When did that come out? That was 90. We were supposed to come out in 90. Uh, 2015, so 95, so Silver Bayonet, uh, Operation, uh, Air and it's the other one. I forget the third one. Those were the first three games that GMT produced, and that was 95, 95. I want to say. So sometime after that, I want to say, I want to say, oh, maybe I have those dates wrong. I don't know. We'd have to go look. I can, I can look it's it in the 90s. Yeah, yeah I, it's I in the 90s. Yeah, it's no big deal. So if you, look, if you look on a GMT box, there's four numbers on the box. The first two are the year it was released. Right. Well, there's a little insight right there. I, I didn't realize that. Yep. Uh, um, and so as, a, you know, as an Uber developer slash designer, mm -hmm. what, uh, how did you go about doing the research for the modern forces that are in play there? Do you have guys helping you do that, or are you reaching out on the web, or what's the story? What happened there? It, yeah, it's 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 a combination of all that, really. Um, so, let's take Poland, because that's obviously, it's the one most recent on my mind. Um, you know, we start, I start with a map concept of how do I think things need to be portrayed, um, which, of course, leads to whole kinds of questions and answer sessions about why aren't the Baltics a hex map? Uh, you know, you start there and then we'll do a terrain analysis, or I'll do a terrain analysis and then fortunately a lot of people are interested and so they hear that it's working and we had a guy in Poland uh, he's in the he's in the credits I'm not going to attempt to butcher his name because I don't know how to pronounce <laughs> it but um, <laughs> he uh, he's like, hey I'll take a look at that. So we sent it to him, and he said, well, you know, this is really hilly or here or not here, or this is wooded, or there's a lake here that you missed, or, uh, you know, things along those lines. Um, and so that's what, kind of where we start. And then you start looking at orders of battle, and there's a couple of guys who contributed to that, um, although the, the primary source for that for me was uh, the uh, IIS, IISS, right. International Institute for Strategic Studies. They put out the military balance every year. Um, so the only problem with that is, is it lists numbers of, uh, say, regiments and brigades, but doesn't. It rarely puts designations to them, and so the order of battle kind of becomes a cross between 
what the I or what the military balance says it is. It's freely available on Wikipedia or um, uh, Strat Four or something like that, right? right. And and you kind of get this this mix and mash uh, deal. And of course, most places are not, especially places like Russia, <laughs> are not very forthcoming about what they really you know, have. So, not as bad as the North Korean order of battle, which is as good as it could be, you know, but. <coughs> yeah, interesting. And does that, uh, so with, with North Korea, there's a lot of guessing there, right? And, you're, you're, mm-hmm. and you also have, have playability issues in terms of you know, making it worth, well, worthwhile, right? Yeah, and I remember you and I had that conversation a, a long time ago. And, and part of it is nobody really knows, right? right, I, right. Because, you know, they have a huge stand, they have a huge standing arbor, army. Everybody knows that. Um, nobody knows how good they are. Um, you know, we, we kind of think we know which some of the formations are. And, and uh, Joseph Bermudez, who, um, I forget the name of the, the work, but he's, he's a North Korea specialist. Uh, we ran a lot of it by him. And he said, that's as good a guess as anybody else's, right? Um, although he was more in the know to know. And we had a couple of... Uh, I-Corps planning guys who also looked it over and could, couldn't really confirm, but, you know, could, could say that it was good enough for a game kind of a deal. So. Mm-hmm. Well, that's kind of good. That's good anecdotal <coughs> evidence, though, isn't it? Right? It's, right. You know, right. It's, if some guy goes, uh, oh, well, you know, that's, that looks like a load of crap. Right. You know, you're probably off base somewhere. Yeah. Right. Go to well, and, I'm, and I do know that, so I, I, I know there was at least one uh, guy who took the Korea game and used it in his classroom at the uh, general staff college. And he said, we, we, we used the map and we used a modified version of the rules and we used our order of battle. <laughs> I'm like, Oh, okay. <laughs> I guess you can't tell me what that was. Nope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and there's probably a very good chance they, they bumped capabilities up even higher if the U S forces too, right? <laughs> Lasting your waters for no words. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, so coming back to map, right? So it sounds like yep. in this particular instance, in with Poland, you looked yep. at land mass and scale, and got some advice on that, and then obviously at some point realized that you know size was going to be an issue, and uh, tracking guys across the 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 um, flat wooded pine pine trees of uh you know the baltics would not be fun right so h- how did that come about uh, what did you I, did you hex map it out or what yeah so i'll, I'll get a I, you know i have a blank uh hex map area a, a, a digital version right sure. and i'll take a i'll take a two two scale representation of the map area and i'll just map it out and say oh well look to put the whole Baltics on there would have required three more maps, you know, um, which is great for a monster game perspective, but a, a little bit unwieldy from a real life perspective. And then, so, but that wasn't the whole story, right? If that had been the right way to go, then we would have made it work somehow. Um, but what really boiled that particular decision down was that the Baltic states, now it's getting better, but at the time they had 19 total battalions to defend the entire, mm. all, all three Baltic mm-hmm. states, right? And that included the reserve battalions. So that wasn't just the active battalions, right? Um, to, or maybe that was just the active battalions. Either way, they didn't have very many, right? So you would have you would have been playing this hex-based game on this huge, expansive map, and, the, you know, the, the end result would have been exactly the same. Right, right. And, and <laughs> the, uh, probably the, I don't know what's the word for it, Impetus would have been, oh gosh, I've got to rush more guys up there, right? Whereas, mm-hmm. whereas perhaps with the land areas, when I look at the game, I was like, well, you know, I know they're worth VPs and stuff, but let's let's protect Poland first, and, and we'll see mm-hmm. what we will see what we can recover later. Uh, if right. We, if we make the fight for Poland hard enough, then those forces that are holding or or garrisoning up in the north may may come south, and then they might open up a door to do something. Later, who knows? Uh, Correct. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. So, okay. Yep. So, so maps. 
good Intel or relatively good Intel uh, on your counters, and then of course, yep. strengths, right? How how did you where did you start in terms of you know <laughs> there's a lot of guys that have ones and maybe you know, yeah. you know things like that. So obviously there's a base, but but how, how do you reconcile or how did you come to conclusions about strength sure. and yeah. TQ well, or, or what do you want to call it? Uh, yeah, efficiency. T T O N E. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or or, or oh, uh, efficiency. Yeah, yeah, because I mean that's um, that's a factor, right? So yeah, and you know everybody's got their own own take on it. I, I mean, at, at the basic level, a battalion is generally a one one, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that's just that's just how how it starts, and then depending on what kind of equipment they might be fielding, um, those the offensive or defensive values might change, um, and then the movement rate. Uh, you know, may also change whether they're wheeled or mm-hmm. tracked or yep. you know, whatever they're using, and, and and it can even get a little bit different there because a lot of that a lot of that movement is also built into the logistics train that they have. Right, you could be a you could be an armored formation and have wheeled logistics. Well, that's going to slow you down a little bit. So, sure. because as, as much as people would like to race away from their logistics tail, that's not how real officers think right? right they want to know where their beans and bullets are coming from sure. especially their fuel for their tanks so <laughs> exactly. that that ties you down a little bit as well um so a lot of that goes into that um and then at the at the end of the day after you play a few rounds you start tweaking values right because you know we're not looking to produce a uh command and general staff simulation right because that would take spreadsheets and spreadsheets and 50 umpires and all kinds of stuff we're looking to create a playable game that's enjoyable. So you need you need something that some dumbass blogger can uh, play and actually uh, <laughs> right get it get, get, get partially right while he's trying to do it live. There you go. See, I can't be there all the time. I know. I was hanging the other night. I was like, but, oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> although although you know it's funny not to get off on too far of a tangent maybe, yeah. but rules writing is is so interesting because uh, you know I'll. I'll I'll write something down, and Ralph, who, who was the developer on Next War Poland, he'll take a look at it and be like, "Yeah, you know, that's not really that clear," and he'll change it around. And then we'll send it out to playtesters, and half of them will say, "I like the first version," and the other half will say, "I like the new version." And I, I realize I'm exceeding 100, percent but then there's always that one guy. I still don't get it, right? Yes. So, yes. You know, you can write. You, there, there is no such thing. Well, I won't say that because I'm sure there is, but there are very few rules that couldn't stand to be. Reworded. The problem is you'd have to have twice as many words to make it clear for everybody who reads them. Exactly. Exactly. That was a well. Let's leave the company out of it. I was looking at a rule set the other day up in Seattle, and uh, it, it used to be a fifteen-page rule book, and it's now <laughs> clocking in at seven. Wow. <clears throat> that's that's some verbiage. Yeah, and it's, it, it was an early draft, so I got to give them credit. And bigger mm-hmm. font and all the sort of, you know, lots of examples and that sort of stuff. But I, I, just, right. I put it down and said, I would go back to that guy and say, hey, right. maybe you need to make this 25. And then come back and uh-huh. talk to me because I'm, I'm not reading this. Uh, right. So. Well, I mean, to be perfectly honest, that's uh, so Silver Bayonet and and Gene would probably admit it too. Is that you know that was their, it was their first effort, it was the first game he ever did, right? Yeah. And so some of the rules just they just weren't that clear, right? The the ideas and the concepts were there, they just weren't that clear, and so people continually struggled with them. So part of the cleanup was all right. Well, let's let's clean these things up, try to provide some clarity, and then along the way, obviously, we made a whole host of other changes, but sure. um, those rules ballooned to. I don't even remember what the final rule count was, but it was bigger than the original, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, so that, let's talk about wordsmithing then. Right? When you when you are looking at, you come up with an idea. So let's so let's talk about supply for a second because that's kind of an interesting construct in the next war system. As you've got mm. you've got supply, you've got being out of supply, and you've got isolation, and then you've got the multiple uh, aspects of different elements that will allow you to be in supply or have a line of communication and they all have movement rates tied to them so when you were trying to construct that i don't know how much of that existed in the original system Mm -hmm. and how much you just just sort of poured it over but how did you how did you nail that down (laughs) so the honestly at this point i don't even remember what the original system was i I think the original system was more just uh an loc a line of communication thing right 
Uh, but it did have supply depots uh, and MSUs, so that those were kind of in, in, integral into that. Uh, and then extending that, I think we added HQs into the line. And so as a as an OCS player myself, you know, I, I kind of took that concept of, uh-huh. well, here's your supply source, here's your LOC, and then your HQ can, can extend it, right? Um, I like that model. It's, it models what HQ should do. And it also, you know, a lot of the times designers are always like, how do you keep players from spreading their units out willy-nilly, right? right? Well, you tie them to a logistical tail, and it's a lot more efficient to get your H- supply from that HQ, which means you have to be in the HQ's range, right, than it is to try to find some other supply source. And so it's it's one of those, uh, you know, things of, well, you, you make them all part of formation, they can only draw from that formation. Well, now you've tied them to that HQ, at least somewhat. It doesn't mean you can't go herring off on some weird mission with your armored brigade, but you better find some spy for it. So right. and the and the wordsmithing around that, because that that can be that can get complicated when people are trying to understand the difference between isolation and supply. So how did you Yeah in how did you rationalize that's why, all that? Right. And that's why we were very clear well <laughs> we tried to be very clear, how's that? Uh, in the isolation that this is different from the supply, yes. um, although usually the same conditions will cause you to be isolated, right? Um, but it's a little bit more lax because s- supply is a very definite thing, right? You, you, uh, you, you're getting your beans and your bullets and your fuel, and, and you either are or you're not. Isolation is a little bit different of, you know, a little bit of supply might, be, might or might not be trickling in, but you just feel it's more of a morale thing than it is anything else, which is why you roll against the efficiency rating, yes. right? Yes. Of, of, yes, you're out of supply, probably, um, but you're also cut off and with no hope of maybe ever regaining your supply line. So it's not that you outran your supply, it's there's people between you and your supply, and so you start feeling, you know, cut off, isolated. Right, so, the consequences. Um, it's, right. Exactly, with some consequences. <laughs> and uh, even with the... Uh, High efficiency rating units. You know that's why it's a die roll. Right. Some some units are going to last forever, and some it's just kind of like the clearing rolls. Sometimes you'll you'll take that six clearing number and take it the first turn, and sometimes you sit there for three turns trying to clear that. Yeah, they're a bugbear. They're uh, yep. They're holding up the Russian advance right now. I can tell you that. Uh, <laughs> I was if, there's, if there's honestly, if there's one rule, I'm I'm very proud of. It's that advanced, it's that clearing operations stuff. Yeah, it's very cool. I was looking at the map the uh, the other night, actually. In fact, it was last night. I sat down and I was looking at, and I looked at the little towns, and I started moving uh, towards them to take them, uh, to just, you know, kind of roll through them, and then stage to go into the next uh, to attack the the poles who were behind the river. And I looked and I went. Oh no 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 no! If I go in that city, I'm gonna have to clear it. <laughs> mm-hmm, went, exactly. Oh my God! I can't trace supply, and so right. you know the cascading effect. I just went, okay. All those guys are now not gonna move that way. <laughs> they're gonna move closer right. to their HQ, and they're all gonna focus on these two towns. So uh, right. it works. <laughs> which 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 well as you say, which is part of it, right? You you, you shouldn't just be entering us willy nilly. You should be. As an operational commander, you should be thinking: Do I really want to commit my troops to a clearing operation right now? You know. Yep. Yep. You start adding up those stacking points and going, "Ooh, that's not going to be pretty." So. Yep. Yeah. So good stuff. That worked really well. Um, I'm gonna, I want to talk about playtesting in a minute, but uh, mm-hmm. it, would you say it's fair that the the game has some genesis in the Third World War system? Oh, absolutely. The air oh. system, especially. You know, you can you can see parts and pieces of it in there, um, and, I, and I think James talked about that before when he first was putting Crisis Kree together. He pulled from a bunch of different sources, one of which was uh, Third World War, which I like. I think it's a it's a fun little system. So, yeah, yeah just curious. Yeah, I, I don't know Gene and haven't really <laughs> read, read anything he's he's written or discussed oh, okay. that yeah. much. So I don't know much about him. Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, other, other than he owns. Part of GMT. So okay. So now, so I'm just thinking through this. So, general uh, political concept maps counters. You've got some rules that kind of sort of work. You've had you've had the Ralph machine grinding on you about uh, verbiage, and now you're ready to do 
play testing, uh, you have the advantage of having the fabulous uh, band of drunkards, I mean, uh, grog guards uh, <laughs> from AAC to play test. Yeah. So with Ralph leading the merry band of men, I assume, in terms of trying to drive the testing. Yeah. And usually. Yeah. And. Although, so, so what will what'll usually happen, yeah, so, for instance, right now we're working on the supplement number two. Yep. And that's got uh, the insurgency rules in it. So we're going to bring some, you know, um, the South or South Korea and or the allies conquered North Korea. Uh, and now they're occupying it while they rebuild, except that for all those DPRK guys that are now fighting an insurgency war, the, those rules that we're working on will let you fight that insurgency battle, right? But before we release it to playtesters, Ralph and I have played, I think we're on our third game now, and we'll continue to play until we think it's ready for round one, right? It, which means you've played it, uh, played enough turns and haven't made any changes to the rules that it's in a relatively stable state. So then we'll release it to playtesters, say, knock yourselves out. And then feedback will come back and we'll release another iteration and then that just kind of ramps up and that and that's where that whole playtesting thing comes into play and how do you how structured is your playtesting when you go through that exercise i mean you know like if, i know there's dave and ralph playing and then there's other people playing right yeah well and, and i can't speak to other folks uh experience with it but Usually what happens is you put out a call for playtesters. And, and don't get me wrong, we have a couple of really good ones who have playtested every single Next War game. Oh, really? Uh, and they always provide good feedback. Uh, Dan Stuber comes to mind. Um, and now, of course, I'm going to get hate mail because I didn't mention somebody else's name. But uh, he, he just pops to mind immediately because he's always ready and he's, he's willing to play. Uh, but So you have those guys. But then you have other guys who say, yeah, I'll playtest. And then you send them materials, you never hear from them again. Yeah. So... I mean, for the most part, that's just true of anything. And, and I'm not necessarily blaming them. Sometimes just life gets in the way. And, you know, playtesting some game is really low on the priority. And telling you that they can't playtest is even lower on the priority list, right? Right. Um, which is okay. But the, the hard part then becomes, all right, well, now we have to get it tested. And as you're aware, because you've played them, these are big games. And you can't, unfortunately, you can't test everything. So... Right. That, so that's an interesting aspect to all this because these these titles are not uh, small, and you have multiple scenarios in these games. And so I, I assume that the campaign game that perhaps certain aspects of the smaller scenarios might just get played out anyway. But you've got a lot of scenarios to test and a lot of variables. Uh -huh. How how uh, your guys that do the play testing? How many times are they typically trying to? play the game are they playing all of it some of it uh, um yeah most of the time it's a full playthrough um sometimes it's just you, you know so you come across something that's so broken you just have to reset right sure um and i know so ralph and i try to play at least every uh uh big scenario at least at least once all the way through and then portions of of you know if we found something wrong let's re reset and kind of again but um, and then the play testers, it kind of varies, and you know, Ralph will say, "Hey, why don't you guys play this one, or you guys play this one?" You know, and then you just you get feedback. Yep. What about scenario balancing? You've got a lot of variables in these games when it comes down to <clears throat> numbers of of Q, uh, yep. cruise missiles and regular ballistic missiles and aircraft at start and re replacements and supply points. How do you? Is that just you know? You swagging it, or you uh, what, what's going on? How's that work? Yeah, the, 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 so the initial set are you know because you got to start somewhere. The initial set is a swag. Obviously, it's an educated swag, right? Based on all right, this is how it worked in previous iterations. So yep. if we start with this, let's see how let's see how it affects the this particular scenario with this terrain and these kinds of units. And then from there, you kind of this is where you get that whole effect thing. You you tweak. So, for instance, the Russian supply points used to be really small, and we kept increasing it because we just found they needed more to make it viable. And it's not, and it's one of those things of, it's not just for a game balance effect. It was a, well, you know, Russia's a pretty big nation. They would probably have a few more supply points and ready stockpiles, and they're the ones planning the war. 
So yeah, let's give them, let's bump them up a few more, right? right. Um, and so it becomes it becomes a, a trial and error, and that's where those, especially those initial plays of the first three or four turns, come become really handy, because it's not so much how many they're spending; it's the rate that they're being spent at. And then you kind of backfill into okay, if this is a twelve turn scenario, then we don't want to give them enough to last the whole game necessarily, but we want to, you know, tweak it just so so it fits the situation. And so I'm assuming then the play test is going to keep track of some of that for you then when you're play testing, you're asking them to keep track of supply points consumed or you just look at yep. the log file that is all on back. Yeah, usually I say usually, yeah, I don't, we don't, it, it's almost, almost always over Vassal. So we just upload a log file somewhere and, you know, Ralph or I'll you know, plug away through that log file and keep note of what's happening. Uh, uh, but sometimes it's something so, out of the norms, not necessarily something like supply points, but some rule or something that doesn't work. The placer say, hey, um, I tried this, and here's what happened. <laughs> and I don't think it should work that way. So then we put our heads together, and, and most of the time, playtesters are, are right, right? Um, sometimes it's, no, 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 that's, that really is supposed to work that way. You better come up with something, some tactical answer to that. <laughs> right. Right. <clears throat> okay. Now, uh, so with uh, insurgency uh, rules and that supplement, would that then open you up to an opportunity to uh, play some role of uh, or game out some aspects of uh, conflicts in the Middle East? Uh, probably in the back of my head, that's that's where it's headed. Um, the the problem I see it there is it's uh, well, I mean, right now it's so much in flux, right? That. Uh, well, Syria in particular, so much in flux that I, I'd hesitate to put something. Oh yeah, yeah. Together. I'm just curious, but, as a when, but, you know, when you. But yeah, it's it's definitely so. It's it's another tool to be able to do there, and the rules are written such that you could have insurgents working alongside regular units, right? right. So I'm thinking of the post, you know, of the, of the second Iraq War, basically, right? So right. So you, you've got a invasion from. Kuwait, you've got the, yep. the rapid the rapid success, and then you've got a, what is it, what are we at, 10, 12, 15 years now? I don't know how many years we're into it now, but uh, it's, a lot. it's a lot. <laughs> and you've got uh, Afghanistan as well that was also, right. uh, you know. A quick... It's been 11 since I was there. How's that? <laughs> yeah, right. There you go. What, what, uh, what uh, unit were you in, by the way? Uh, I was in uh, a, uh, an engineering company. Okay. So... We uh, bridge bridge engineers. So we went over to put some temporary bridges to replace the ones we knocked down. <laughs> <laughs> Although, so I'll never little anecdote. I'll never, I'll never forget. Well, obviously, but, but it goes without saying. But but we had to go. <laughs> we had we had to go to one site and take out. Um, so there's lots of different kinds of bridges in the ar- that the Army uses, right? Yep. I mean, we still have Bailey bridges, right? The Bailey is what the 101st put over the yeah, yeah. the sun, right? So we still use those, um, not as often. But uh, we had, in one spot there in southern Iraq, we put it in GB, which is a medium girder bridge. It, the best way to describe it is like a big erector set uh, that you, you put together and you kind of push across. And But it's a newer newer bridge, right? And it's very easy to put in and very easy to, or relatively easy to take out. So we, somebody decided, well, we don't want to leave that expensive piece of equipment. So we had to go take the new MGB out and put a Bailey in in its place. But the purpose for the bridge was so that the, the village could get their sheep from the village over across the river to their grazer, grazing land and back. Oh no, so they couldn't walk across it. <laughs> right. But saying that, you can probably Imagine what that bridge we took out looked like. Because uh, no. the sheep didn't care. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that that was fun. And I don't mean really fun. Yeah, I know what you mean. That's interesting. Interesting. Well, now, uh, so, to kind of get you back on top of you. So, yeah. play, play test. Everything comes out great. Everyone loves it. And you're feeling good about it. When, uh, when it comes to packaging up, uh, the title, you, you guys, and I don't know whether this is all just like the GMT standard, you know, methodology, yeah. or whether this is the Mitch Land. It's got to be awesome uh, ideas uh, department. 
but the charts and tables and information are extraordinarily well done. Uh, where does that come from? Uh, so a lot of it actually, I won't say a lot of it, some of it existed in the original, but Charlie Kibler does uh, all that layout stuff, and he's just, he's been doing it so long, I don't think he even thinks about it. Hmm. So we, we rough out, I'll rough out something initially. Um, take For instance, let's take the strike table that we are talking about, <coughs> oh, excuse me, a little bit earlier. Yeah. I'll, I rough that out, right? And it's kind of kind of close to what was in the original, but then we keep adding information to it. But Charlie will take it and he'll lay it out in such a way that it makes sense and he'll color, he'll shade things and, and whatever so that it's useful. And then what I, what I think is cool, Ralph will go through the rules and he'll say things like, well, you have this diorale modifier hidden in this rule. Let's put it on the chart somewhere, yes. right? Yes. Um, that's also the reason, like, in the latest advanced game tables chart, uh, on the front, on the lower right corner, there's two, two new sections that weren't really there before. Um, one's the theater weapon target list, because everybody was always, well, what can I hit with them? And they'd have to go back to the right. rules to find it. Well, now you don't run. And then the out of supply effects, right? Those those were always missing. Now they're right there on the chart. So, and, and you know, I was just I was just bitching the other day about the fact that uh, I, in fact I wrote them on the piece of plex the supply sources and the ranges for them. I was, I was, <laughs> yep. I was bitching about how <clears throat> you know why the hell is not on the chart? Why is that the only thing out of the whole kind of <laughs> game that's not on the friggin' charts? And of course. Here it is, right? And then, very front page. Lo and behold. Yeah, on the left hand side, <laughs> as I'm looking at it, talking right. to you right but, now. But, but I mean, that's the point, right? Yep. It took us, what, to the fourth iteration to figure that out? Yep. So. I didn't even think about looking for that because I so. Right. You don't use the front page terribly often. You know, it's, no. it's that one phase or uh, two phases right. in, the, in the advanced game, and the rest of the time you're really not. Uh, right. You're mostly in the middle, right? Yep. So. Oh, yeah. I, I actually keep it folded over backwards, but uh, right. that's how I use it. But. Uh, well, you know, you're saying that it it it, it really because I've been thinking about this a lot lately is, um, and it's kind of spawned out of the, the ongoing conversation um, uh, I'm having with Joel and you and a couple other folks on Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with, with Joel's playthrough, mm -hmm. Joel Toppin's playthrough, mm -hmm. about how, and I think I said it on their their time in game, I, I'm starting to realize that I'm almost. And I'm sure it's probably affecting Ralph too, but we're we're so steeped in the rules and so familiar with the game that sometimes we have recognizing that it's not necessarily as clear. Going back to our original conversation, as clear or as, mm -hmm. or is it saying what we really think it's saying? Mm -hmm. Which is why I'm happy to answer questions about it. But I, it just kind of struck me the other day of of how t t time and game is really what gives you that. Obviously, I know I'm not. <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir, right? But we don't we don't see a lot of that because of the cult of the new. So, but especially a game like this, it rewards that time and game because you stop worrying about am I getting the rules right because you've played it so much. Right, right, exactly. And and you know that's a thing. Even with the simplest system like the, the Total War. Uh, yep. Uh, sorry, not the Third World War uh, system from Chadwick. You know, you can play. You can read those rules, play the game. And have a good time, and then you can play that game for the fifth time with all the modules, and mm -hmm. these layers start coming out in the system. And right. it's hard in the cult of the new to you know you play a bad game, you play a bad game, and you kind of move on from it. But sometimes there are great games right. that deserve more, and this is one of those where I don't <laughs> have I probably got like forty turns of this in. When you really think about it, you look at the you know, three or four times I've played, it's probably eight or ten turns of scenario that can get done. And mm -hmm. that's not a lot of experience to try and make decisions about, like I was asking you the other day about, well, what the, what, what the hell am I going to do with the aircraft carriers? And the <laughs> why, why, yep. Where should they go and why should I send them there versus somewhere else? And I, you know, there's right. lots of reasons why they could or could not do certain things. But you don't right. know that until you play it mm -hmm. a lot. <laughs> yep. Well, and that's what I like. In I think, you know, I hope, or at least I hope we've done it well in the next War Series, is that I like to give, I, I like to make sure the players have lots of choices to make. Yes, yes. 
right? Yes. But I, 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 and, this, and I deliberately don't answer those kinds of questions on BGG or console order. Well, what do you think the best strategy or tactic? And I'm like, I don't know. You figure. <laughs> you, I gave you the tools. You go build something. You know. Right. Right. Um, uh, because I think that's for me at least that's part of the enjoyment. Yep. So. Yep. I, I mean, I could literally see myself turning around and either setting up just the land area map uh -huh. and playing a scenario if, the, if I don't know if there is one. Uh, but playing a scenario out of that and just to work that out, right? Work Really work out the naval game, really work out yep. what to do with everything, and then come back and play the campaign game yep. again because it, it's engaging, and that's a that's a, a testament to the quality of the system. Uh -huh. So, Yeah, and that, that land area, I, that's funny that you say that because that's, I mean, that's the non-allied player, Soviet player, let's call them Soviets, right? Because um, we all make that mistake, apparently. Um <laughs> But uh, <laughs> how do you have to figure out how do I take this with the least amount of force possible, right? Yes. <clears throat> so. Yeah, and that's uh, that's I'm still trying to knock out Talon, so. Uh, <laughs> yep. I mean, it's only turn two, but uh, I'm yeah. I'm trying to you know kind of clean that up. But, uh, yep. All right. So uh, and then you're so tell me about the the box art. Uh, you know, because it, it's a very, it's a very similar across all the the boxes, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's kind of a, what's a, a collage style. How did that come about? Or is, is that is that referencing back to the old game? Or uh, no, I don't think the old. I'm trying to picture the box. I don't think the old game have it. That's all, Roger. Okay. Um, okay. I, I actually don't have. Uh, any input into it? Right. Um, I, I think he's. I think he's done a great job. And they definitely like if you put them all. If you stand them all together, you know they're all part of the same thing. They all they look good, right? When they're yep. stacked or whatever. Yep. Um, although I will, say, I do have to say that my favorite is the uh, the tank with the clinically insane on it because <laughs> yeah. it's written on the barrel. Yes, a buddy of mine uh, just in fact just before I got online with you, he just received a copy of Next War Korea. And he's got a zoomed-in picture of the of that yep. barrel. Uh, and he's like, I, got it, I, got it, I finally got now I've got the whole set. Have you played him yet? He goes, oh, no. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's that's always the bugaboo, right? Yeah, it is. All right. Well, um, what else? So I don't want to keep you all night. I know you're in you know, a hotel room, but you've probably got better things to do than listen to crap on. So um, <laughs> what uh, what else comes to mind when when you're going through the design exercise for yourself, you know. You, oh, yeah. yeah. So, I, and I don't think we really got to that. <clears throat> you know, usually the impetus for me, obviously other than uh, Next War Korea's start, um, is a subject matter. So, uh, Silver Bayonet for me was really because I was getting, I had read, read um, We Were Soldiers. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you know you, you can check the bibliography in that in the back of that in the rule book. And so I just started reading and reading and voraciously reading all that material, and you just kind of steep yourself in it. Uh, and for me, that's kind of the that's kind of like where I want to start. I want to start by understanding what motivated the decisions of the commanders at whatever level you, you're trying to depict, mm -hmm. right? So in in the Iadrang, it was <clears throat> it was really the the divisional commanders, what were they trying to accomplish? And then, obviously, their subordinates are the ones who carried it out. Um, and so, how do you then wrap your head around? So that that drives victory conditions usually, right? Because that's that's where victory lies is in the head, the mind of the commander, really. And then, uh, and then I then from there, I kind of step down into the uh, how do the troops actually accomplish their mission? And that's why. You, and I, I'm pointing silver bayonet especially because you can definitely see there's a wide variety between how the how the U.S. for in the jungle and how the NBA operate in the jungle, right? They both have different capabilities, different strengths, different weaknesses, and uh, getting getting to that level of detail, you have to understand the history that drove it, right? Uh, Otherwise, you're just kind of shooting in the dark. Sure. Sometimes that works, and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. So. And so, with, so with that, uh, 
the subject matter obviously then drives your level of interest to design again, you know, design or to develop, you know, be the Uber developer as we like to call you. Uh, huh. Where, when you're sourcing, are you trying to, how broad are you going in terms of looking for research material and content? Um, well, again, we can take Silver Bay Net for the example. I, I went pretty broad. You know, I, I read books that ran the gamut of um, very specific to the battle, to this is Vietnam, to here's, here's some poems and stories and fiction around Vietnam. And you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, including, the anti, including the anti-war views, because I think, it, it, although in 1965 it wasn't as much of a deal, yes. I, knew that, I knew that the audience was going to see that, right? And they're trying, to see, they're trying to see this game set in 65 through the lens of 50 years later, it, and it's different, right? In 65, it was all pretty much roses for the most part. You know, I'm not going to speak too broadly, but um, nobody thought it was going to be a big deal, right? So, you know, I would say the, I mean, obviously the specific, for a historical battle, the specific books are going to be the better ones. Yep. Um, but you, I think you still, you can't lose sight of that overall picture. Like why, if you're doing a tactical, but why was that particular battle being fought? Because that informs things. It does. It does. Did you, were you surprised by any of the reading that you, you did that, uh, changed your view of the battle? Um, surprise, um, it did enlighten a few things. Uh, you know, I didn't, I had always, for instance, I'd always come at it from the U S centric point of view. And by doing that broad reading, I had to read other points of view around it, either from our allies who weren't as quite enamored with the adventure, you know, or, um, you know, a VC memoir, memoir, bleh, memoir about not, not specifically about the battle, but just in general, which was, you know, a little bit more enlightening around why did the VC and the NVA fight, right? What, what was their motivating factor? So that, that, that I think to me was actually more valuable than reading about the battle itself in terms of understanding the broad impact. Yes. Yes. Interesting. That's pretty cool. Hmm. Well, and so uh, what else should we cover in terms of your, uh, your genius level uh, creativity? <laughs> yeah, genius level. You're a funny guy, Kev. <laughs> uh, well, no, look, I really think... I really yeah, think, I don't know. You know I, I think you do a great job. But what you've done with this system, the, the rules are incredibly crisp. I, I mean, if I was going to stack you up uh, in terms of rule clarity and availability mm-hmm. and accessibility. You know, Dean Essig does an, a, a monster amazing job with his rule sets. Uh, I, I he does. I put you right up there, man, in terms of, of you know, accessibility, him and Chadwick and uh, yourself, I think are doing a great job. And you're, 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 you're a freshman <laughs> at this. Thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. I really, yeah, I've, I've played tested one of Dean's games, and he's he's a mad fiend when it comes to wording and rewording and rewording and rewording until it's just right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing for me is that uh, I'm a gamer first, right? right. I, I, I'd much rather be playing a game than designing one, and who wouldn't? Right. I, I don't know. Right. but um, And so I always try to make sure that I'm looking at it from the standpoint of, you know, if this, if, if I had shelled out 60, 70, 80, whatever dollars for games is something I'd want to play, you know? Right. Um, although on the, the funny thing is, is at the end of this, the other end of that spectrum is if I'm the only one who ever played a, uh, an X-War series game, I'd probably be okay with that. Cause <laughs> you know, is it fun? Right. Yeah. And you're, right. you're enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, I, I think the, the job uh, or the role of designer is uh, is a lot of fantasy around it. You know, I, <laughs> yep. I, you know, everyone goes, oh, well, you know, I would love to just design games and have my own, des- you know, company. And it's like, I don't think you would. <laughs> I, I know yeah. I wouldn't. Uh, mm-hmm. I would not. I would not want to be working at my play, so to speak. Uh, right. Not. Right. Well, and uh, yeah, and I've. 
I, so every so often you have to take a break. Well, I have to take a break. I'm like, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to touch the next war game. I'm not going to touch Silver Bayonet. I'm just going to go play a bunch of different games. Because, you, you know, you have, to, you have to maintain that connection, so to speak. Yes. Um, and then you also just got to let your brain rest, you know, because otherwise <clears throat> you just get too focused in, in on that. And, and like you said, it's no longer play, it's work. Right. I don't want it to be work. Right. And I think you can get stale on it as well. I was talking to another designer the other day and I was asking what he was playing. He goes, oh, I, I'm, all, I'm designing. I don't have time to play anyone else's games. <laughs> how, do you, yep. how do you get any fresh ideas, man? You're, you've been... Exactly. Right. Well, and, and he just, it, yeah, it just it gets old, you know, and at the end of the day, I want to love it, not hate it, you know. Right. And you can, right. you can ask, you can ask my wife. She's like, well, if you counted up all the hours you spent on that, then you're getting paid slave wages. Yes. <laughs> you know. Yes. Um, and that's the thing is, most designers are doing it because they love what they're doing. Yes. And they want to, they want to see it. I mean, it, you know, I get a little giddy when I get the the first copy and you rip the shrink and there's that that product you've been working on, but it's able thing now it's not play test counters or you know printed off maps it's it's real production value stuff and it's just a good good feeling you know yeah that must be very uh very satisfying for that uh, that experience yeah that's cool well i, I kind of cut you off there you I, I was asking you whether you had oh. other other points that you wanted to raise about your design ex, ex, you know your design uh, journey as you go through building a game mm. Not, not really. I think we covered the most, uh, most of the salient ones. Like I said, it's it's the history. If it's a historical subject, you know, it's the history. Yeah. I like personally. I like to start with the map, and then the order of battle. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, because the map usually drives a lot of the other things you have to think about, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you know, the hard part is start. If you're starting with a blank slate, it's always harder to start writing those first rules. Right. <laughs> how, how do you make this work? within the context of all that reading you did, you know, so, you know, like in Silver Band, how, how am I going to make the NVA feel like NVA? How am I going to make the U.S. feel like the U.S.? Yes. You know? So, and then, how you know, translating, doing that mental translation of, well, this is how history worked into, I'm going to write a rule that lets you do so-and-so and such-and-such, -such, but there's this dial modifier because sometimes it didn't always work perfectly, you know? Right, right. That's the, that's the genius, if you want to put it. Well, that's the that's that's what makes games shine, I think, uh, as well, is that that you put the thought you put the thought behind the mechanic that represents the history as you view it, right? As the designer, Correct. the designer's intent. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and and you know, despite best intentions, you know, most. Most mechanics have a specific reason why they're in there, right? Because you could abstract a whole ton of stuff away. Sure. And lots of people like that, and that's fine, right? Yep. Um, but a lot of the time is, you know, usually a mechanic is trying to make a specific point. And could you could you abstract that out and still make the same point? Maybe. I, you know, I don't know. Um, I don't want to think that hard. <laughs> right. And you tend to err towards the more uh, richer detail games in your gaming life anyway i do yeah. yep mm -hmm. so that's it. yeah i mean you know as 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 our buddy clay says crunchier is better yeah exactly exactly he's not wrong uh, although there i have my limits but uh yeah yeah oh, oh absolutely i mean there there are some games i've played and you know so i, I get, and it, but it goes back to what i was just saying detail for the sake of detail i'm out right right, right. Um, if I can discern the reason behind that detail, I'll, I'll probably accept it. But when it's piled one on another, on another, on another campaign for North Africa, who's talking about you? But um, then it gets a little bit unwieldy, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right, man. Well, thank you for uh, taking the time to have a chat. And uh, No problem. It's always, it's always good to hang out with you, whether it's face-to-face uh, -face or, uh, or online. So, uh, it's good talking. I appreciate the chance. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll uh, uh, so I'll uh, pause it here, but I'll 